Today is Leitare Sunday here in Post Falls, Idaho. Leitare Sunday is usually in rose-colored vestments. Flowers are permitted on the altar. The organ may play. And it's a joyful Sunday, a little, uh, a little um, encouragement in the middle of Lent to draw our hearts to the joy of the coming Easter, to help us to be more fervent in the last part of Lent. And already next Sunday is Passion Sunday. The Sunday after that is already Palm Sunday, and then, and then after that Easter Sunday. So Lent is passing quickly, and uh, let us make a good Lent, continue to be generous with conversion of our heart, repentance for our sins, remember the laws of the church, we have to go to communion during uh, Easter time, which is from Septuagesima Sunday to Trinity Sunday. We, we must go to Holy Communion. And then we're obliged, of course, to go to confession once a year. Obviously, this is uh, the bare, bare minimum. In today's war, if, if you go out to battle with tanks and air 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 bombers and submarines you go out with a squirt gun you're just going to get destroyed and these bare minimum rules of the church is to to save as many as possible so obviously we we are obliged god wants us to become saints that's why we're here on earth there's no greater sadness says one great catholic author leon bloy there's no greater sadness than not to be one of the saints. And we're here on earth to become saints, which is simply grow in union with God and fulfill God's will in our life and defend His Holy Catholic faith. So, this Laetare Sunday, the epistle is taken from Galatians chapter 4, St. Paul's letter. Brethren, it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise, which things are said by an allegory. For these are the two testaments, the one from Mount Sinai, engendering into bondage, slavery, which is Agar. For Sinai is a mountain in Arabia, which has affinity to that Jerusalem which now is, and is in slavery with her children. But that Jerusalem which is above is free, which is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren, thou that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For many are the children of the desolate, more than of her that hath a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then, he that was born according to the flesh persecuted him that was after the Spirit. So also it is now. But what says the Scripture? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not the children of the slave woman, but of the free, by the freedom wherewith Christ has made us free. The Holy Gospel. <laughs> Taken from St. John, chapter 6. This is the great gospel of the Holy Eucharist. At that time Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is that of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him, because they saw the miracles which he did on them that were diseased. Jesus therefore went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples, now the Pasch, the festival day of the Jews, was near at hand. When Jesus therefore had lifted up his eyes and saw that a very great multitude comes to him, he said to Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to try him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred pennyworth of bread it's not sufficient for them that everyone may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, said to him, There is a boy here that has five barley loaves and two fish. 
But what are these among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, and the men therefore sat down in number about five thousand. So remember what St. Ephraim says, five thousand, the Jews only counted the men. So if you include women and children, you're easily into the ten thousand zone. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to them that were set down, in like manner also of the fish, as much as they would eat. And when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, lest they be lost. They gathered up therefore and filled twelve baskets. <coughs> With the fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above to them that had eaten. Now those men, when they had seen what a miracle Jesus had done, they said, This is of a truth, the prophet, that is to come into the world. Jesus therefore, when he knew that they would come to take him by force and make him a king, fled again into the mountain, himself alone. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. <coughs> Jerusalem and Babylon. Jerusalem, which was on Mount, the, the Mount Sion. St. Augustine speaks about this very frequently in his commentaries on the Psalms. And in a nutshell, what he says is, and it refers to this epistle today, St. Paul speaking about the two sons of Abraham. And one represents the slavery from the slave woman, and one from the free woman. And these are the two testaments. What are the two testaments? The Old Testament and the New. The one that prepared for Christ from, from Genesis to the last book, which is Maccabees, all that prepared for Christ. And the New Testament is our Lord Jesus Christ. It's His teaching. Some of the monks of the Middle Ages used to call the New Testament the Catechism of the Apostles. The Catechism of the Apostles. Because what, when you read St. Matthew, St. Mark, Luke, and St. John, you're just seeing eyewitnesses of Christ's miracles, of what He said and what he did. And the whole divinity of Jesus Christ shines through the, the Gospels. And especially St. John, who was already battling the heretics of his time, the Gnostics, and heretics who were starting to attack Jesus Christ as God and say that he was just a man. So these were the early, the early seeds of the heresy of Arius, Father Arius, which would explode in the second and third century and into the fourth century so the great Saint John and um, he is the one that really brings out the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ his gospel begins in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and this word is, is the second person of the Trinity who is uttered the word is uttered from the Father but without a beginning of time. And here you touch on the great mystery of the Blessed Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the spiration of the knowledge of the Son and the Father into the person of love. And that person of love is the Holy Ghost. Yet beware, yet beware, the, there was never a time when there was just the Father and not the Son and the Holy Ghost. Or just the Father and the Son and not the Holy Ghost. They were always, from all eternity, the same. United in one nature, one substance, the divinity, but distinct only by relationship of persons. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Here we're touching on some deep theology, but this is the way it is. This is, this is our God. And this is who we adore. It's not Allah, who is a false God. It's not the Jewish God, which, because they refuse the Son and the Holy Ghost, the Jews. 
They refuse Jesus Christ, the Jews. They they hate Jesus Christ. And they and the and as Saint Paul says here, the old the 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 slave always persecutes the, the children of the free. And that is the Old Testament, the Jews, the Zionists, are set to always persecute the Catholic Church. And they will do it till the end of the world. And that's why World War I, World War II, they had to set up and get their land in Palestine, the, the false Jews. And that's why World War I and World War II. That's the really the bottom reason why to get their land, which they have no right to take. And the Zionists want to prepare their kingdom, which is the Antichrist. And it's already foretold in Scripture. All the events of today with the, the economy and the politics and uh, all this converging of everything into the one world religion and one world nation, one world government, it's all preparing to what was already foretold in Scripture, the, the Antichrist. And this must happen. And for the Jews, because they re reject our Lord Jesus Christ, because they spit on Him and crucified Him, they, they are preparing for their Messiah. And their Messiah will be the Antichrist. As Christ Himself said to the, the Zionists of His day, the synagogue of Satan, He told them, I come in My Father's name, and I work the miracles in My Father's name. And you don't believe. I have witnesses, the voice of the Father, the Holy Ghost, and the miracles, and the prophecies, and you don't believe. But there will come that one that comes in His name, and Him you will follow. Because you are not from above, you are of your father, the devil. And they will follow uh, the Antichrist. So this sets the tone, really, for all of history. All of history is this battle a continual battle between the children of Christ and the children of Mary and the children of the darkness and of Satan. And this battle is always, there is never going to be a time when there's peace. And that's why the modern dreamers, <clears throat> or what St. Pius X calls them, utopian dreamers, who dream of peace uh, and the dream of a continual harmony and economic prosperity and no poverty in this world. It's not going to happen. Our Lord said, the poor you will always have with you. And that's why Mother Church, the Catholic Church, in her tradition, is the only solution to these problems of the modern world. And that's why the Catholic Church, since Pius XII and before, these good popes who stood on tradition and defended the faith, they always condemned communism. Socialism, which rob men of private property, turn men into machines of the state, and make them atheist species inhabiting the earth with other species. Hence this worship of environment and ecology and uh, all the laws strangling the, gro the true growth and building on the land. The church has condemned these things. Communism, socialism, Zionism, modernism, evolution of dogma, and evolution also. And uh, all these errors of the modern world, uh, the list can go on, ecumenism, religious liberty, separation of church and state, freedom of the press, freedom of the, of the speech to teach error and heresy. All these things are condemned. And the, as St. Paul says, the synagogue of Satan, the Old Testament, the Jews who reject Christ will, will always be persecuting the Catholic Church. It was in St. Paul's day. Read the Acts of the Apostles. Already the Jews are infiltrating the churches and they're, they're trying to stir the Catholic people to come back to Judaism, to abandon Jesus Christ and go back to Moses. And St. Paul, is, is he's furious. He's fighting them and he defends the faith and he works the miracles to strengthen the faith of these Catholics who were shaking. So never in a time of the church history, there's never been a time when there was some absence of some persecution, whether it be heresy from inside or outside, tyrants trying to crush her, 
uh, persecution from within, persecution from without. This is the history of the church. So, Jerusalem, says St. Paul here, is our mother and she's free. Now what Jerusalem is he talking about? St. Augustine is very clear on this and he, he speaks a lot of this. Christ taught in Jerusalem. But Jerusalem would betray and turn its back and call for Christ to be crucified. So Christ was crucified outside of the earthly Jerusalem. And the earthly Jerusalem, as Christ foretold, and on the way to the cross, He told the weeping women, Don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children, because your children are going to live to see, basically, Jerusalem destroyed in, in the year 70. The year 70, it was surrounded by the Roman soldiers and completely leveled. And Vespasian and Titus, they said, there had to be the hand of God in this, because we could not have done this damage by ourselves. But anyway, they took all the spoils from Jerusalem and carried them in triumph back to Rome. And in Rome was a great triumphal procession. And the Jews ever since had been scattered. So the earthly Jerusalem is finished. It's over. The Jewish religion is dead. It was dead when the moment Christ died on the cross... And the, the veil in the temple, as it were, God taking the veil and ripping it in half. Remember how the, the, the St. Luke and St. John describe this 60 foot veiled, heavy material veil um, separating the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. And only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies once a year. And Zechariah, remember, he entered the Holy of Holies and the angel Gabriel appeared to him and told him that his wife uh, Elizabeth will bear a child. He didn't believe it. So he was made mute. And when he walked out, he couldn't talk. So any, any priest who entered unworthily into the Holy of Holies, he would be struck, struck dead by God. And the Holy of Holies was so sacred because that's where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. And it only, it only shadowed what we have in the Catholic Mass. The, the, the presence of Christ in the Holy Eucharist. So, when that curtain in the temple was ripped from top to bottom, not from bottom up, from top to bottom, and you ladies know how hard it is to cut a thick material with a pair of scissors, and to rip it from, head, from the top to bottom, 60 feet high. That showed the death of the Jewish religion. And then St. Thomas Aquinas says, after the Catholic faith had been sufficiently preached, the Jewish religion was not only dead, but deadly. It was poisonous, noxious. Because it's, it, and, and if you trace all heresies down the history of the church, and there's over 300 heresies. All of them are rooted in the Judaic, Judaic perfidy, the rejection of Christ as God. That's the heart of all error and heresy. They refuse Jesus Christ as God. And that's why Vatican II is so poisonous. It's noxious. That's why we have to fight it till the day we die. And that's why those who swallow it in any way are breathed its... It's, it's poisonous air. They get diseased and sick and die. They lose the faith. And that's why Archbishop Lefebvre, he stood up and said, we cannot compromise with Vatican II in the new Mass at all. We have to stay Catholic. And this, when Christ was crucified outside of the city, one of the Old Testament ceremonies commanded by God was to take a, a scapegoat, a goat, and drive this goat through the city of Jerusalem. And people would spit at it, kick it, throw lettuce at it and tomatoes. And then the high, the high priest would put their hands over the goat. Just like at Mass, right, right at the time of the Ankijitur, the altar boy will ring the bell. The priest puts his hands over the oblata, showing that Christ put, took on himself all the sins of the human race. And the Old Testament priests, not realizing their action was prefiguring Christ, 
They put their hands, that is, they put all the sins of their own and all the people on the scapegoat. And then the scapegoat was driven out of the city through the walls on the west side to die in the wilderness of starvation and dehydration. And that scapegoat prefigures Christ, who was driven in mockery and persecution and condemned by the Israelite priests, the high priests, because they rejected the true Messiah and he was driven outside the, wa the walls on the west side. And Christ was crucified outside the city and died to show, one, the fulfillment of the scapegoat, which Christ really is, because he took on himself all of our sins. And every time we make an act of contrition and go to confession, it's his precious blood that washes our soul, that truly makes us free, that truly breaks the chains of the devil and of mortal sin, and the punishment of mortal sin, which is eternal fire, and the punishment of venial sin, which is a purgatory. And all that is washed away, the guilt is washed away, and the soul is made whiter than snow in baptism and, and the sacrament of confession through the powerful blood of our Lord, and His tears, and His sweat, because He loves each soul, but He, he doesn't force Himself on us. We have to Truly seek Him and be sorry for offending our God. So, He is the scapegoat. And He died outside of Jerusalem on Golgotha. And a tradition holds that Adam's bones are buried underneath Golgotha. And so you have Adam who, who brought death by sin. And the second Adam dying on the cross by His death brought life. The life of the soul and eternal life. And Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. The psalm says, written by St. David a thousand years before Christ, he, he prophesies this event and says that the builders rejected the cornerstone. The cornerstone that was re rejected by the builders, that is the Jews. They rejected the cornerstone of the building, which was Jesus Christ the King. They rejected Him. And they preferred their darkness, they preferred their stones, they preferred their emptiness and their vices to the true life and the true light and the true path to heaven. And this cornerstone was crucified on the cross. And this cornerstone rose from the dead. And this cornerstone ascended into heaven. And this cornerstone is laid as a foundation in heaven. And there the Father is building the new Jerusalem. The old one was destroyed and is finished. The Jewish religion is over. And the, the Antichrist will revive the, the Old Testament sacrifices of animals. He will revive the Old Testament ceremonies. And they will persecute severely the Catholic Church. That is, those traditional Catholics, the few that are left, they will persecute them and crucify them and invent new tortures and old, revive old tortures on them. So if we live to those days, we really got to be very close to the Mother of God and pray to persevere. If we think these days are tough, those days are going to be a little tougher. But God's glory and His grace will shine because many saints will die heroic deaths and martyrs. So... This cornerstone which is in heaven, which is above our mother, says St. Paul, is the heavenly Jerusalem. And the heavenly Jerusalem, as the saints come into heaven, after being chiseled on this earth, he builds this heavenly city. The living stones are the saints entering heaven. So all the, the, every year people go to heaven out of purgatory, and probably very few go straight to heaven from this earth, except baptized babies. But as souls come into heaven, one by one, they are, they are built, as it were, into this heavenly city, glorifying the Blessed Trinity. And this heavenly Jerusalem is the Catholic Church. It's the Catholic Church triumphant in heaven. It's the Catholic Church being purged in the kiln of fire in purgatory. But they're still going to heaven. They're just getting all the rust burnt off. And then on earth, we belong to that heavenly Jerusalem. We belong to that heavenly city by being 
believing all that Christ taught and being members of his mystical body of Christ, which is his Catholic Church. <coughs> and that's why it's so important to, to profess the Holy Catholic faith. Because without professing the Holy Catholic faith, we cannot save our soul. St. Athanasius' creed is so explicit about this, and it's a beautiful creed. It's very long, but it's powerful. And he says it very clearly, unless we profess the Catholic faith, we will be eternally damned. And so those who have their use of reason, we have to find, if we're not Catholic, we have to find the truth. And it's available now on internet, it's like a big library. You can find the truth. And if you pray, God will lead such a soul. And we see miracles like this every year. Souls who are stuck in paganism, who didn't know God, come to the Catholic faith. People who have, who have been false religions come to the Catholic faith of tradition. People who are confused and lost in the heresies of Vatican II Church, they discover tradition. And those who are even worse, confused in the liberal Catholicism of the new SSPX, or St. Saint, Saint Peter's Fraternity, or in the, uh, the state of Contest errors, they find the truth through prayer. Our Lady leads them. And we're supposed to use our mind to find and, and seek and understand deeper the Holy Catholic truth. And those who are born cradle Catholics, which most of us are, and, and had been fed in the great, the great sweet wine and the feasts of Catholic tradition, with the true sacraments of tradition, we must not grow lax. We must not grow uh, comfortable. We have to continually deepen and convert every day into the knowledge and the love of our Lord and grow in holiness and grow in sanctity and spread the Holy Catholic faith. We must seek the salvation of our neighbor. And this can be done by example, by good words, by your kindness, by giving people to see websites. You can, they can look up to discover the faith and the tradition and catechisms, even Bishop Sheen's catechisms are, are now available. And so, the heavenly Jerusalem on earth is the Catholic Church. And it's the Catholic Church of tradition. And we profess the same of Athanasian creed that St. Athan Athanasius wrote. We profess the same veneration of Mary and the saints that all the apostles themselves venerated the Virgin Mary. They called her mother, and they witnessed her empty tomb, seeing that she was assumed into heaven. And there's, a, there's another tradition that says all the twelve apostles were there to see the, the, the flowers and lilies that filled Mary's her, her bed of her death, because she had a sleeping more than a death. She died, but it was like a peaceful sleep. And on the third day, the angels carried her body into heaven, and her body and soul were re reunited. And St. Thomas, there's a tradition that says St. Thomas the Apostle was still traveling. He wasn't back in time yet to see Mary's peaceful death, and third day later, her, her assumption into heaven. So St. Thomas said, I don't believe this. I don't believe it. Mary is assumed to heaven. I don't believe Now Christ rising from the dead. All right. I have touched his body. I felt his wounds. But Mary's assumption, no. So a few days later, an angel appeared to St. Thomas. And uh, through him, the girdle, something with the dress of the Virgin Mary, threw him her girdle. And he understood by this angel, giving him the girdle of the Virgin Mary, that she truly was assumed into heaven. And that girdle is kept. It's a relic today. And in fact, a few years ago, five or six years ago, Vladimir Putin of Russia brought that girdle of the Virgin Mary, that relic, into Russia to encourage the Russian women to stop having abortions and take more children. And they even funded government funding to, t to help pay to have more children. And uh, wouldn't that be great if Trump did that? But the girdle of the Virgin Mary shows her, her assumption. And of course, the apostles believe this. The Catholic Church has always believed this. Everything we profess in our catechism was always believed. 
the Holy Eucharist, the sacrifice of the Mass, the primacy of Peter, the papacy, the hierarchy, the church teaching, the church being taught, Ecclesia Docens, Ecclesia Dicens, the seven sacraments, the defense of Christ's divinity, the condemnation of heresies, and all heresies that attack the Catholic faith in any way. So we profess this faith. That's why to be traditional Catholic means, yes, separation, doesn't it? Separation because many people find it easier to follow heresy. And it's more comfortable. After all, in the new conciliar church, they promote NFP. They promote. They don't condemn contraception. They don't condemn Vatican II's errors. And the people believe in ecumenism. This is Archbishop Lefebvre said. This was one of the, one of the biggest dangers of going to the new mass is you become ecumenical. You lose the faith. And even worse, being conciliar church members with the Latin Mass. That's the worst. Because they got the Latin Mass, they think they're Catholic, but they've got the new religion, the conciliar religion, because they accept Vatican II in the new Mass. And that's the, now the position of, sadly, the new SSPX. That is their position. They are really a conciliar, belong to the conciliar church now, at least the leaders know it, and they got the Latin Mass and, sac and traditional appearance of sacraments. But those things are going to be undermined and eroded. And they're already eroding. And we got, um, we got the proof of this. Uh, Father Glez, the, the moral theologian of the Society of St. Pius X, wrote a defense justifying Pope Francis's heretical Amoris Laetitiae. This document is horrible. It's full of heresy and ambiguity, and it deliberately leads to people who are divorced can go to Holy Communion, and they can get a, a, a fast-forward annulment, and all the it encourages uh, contraception and the uh, NFP and all this, and this this document even modernist bishops like Cardinal Burke, who's been sent to Guam as a punishment which is an island in the middle of the Pacific, <laughs> even the modernist bishops see this as wrong. But how is it that the SSPX now is defending this horrible document? And worse than that, <clears throat> I encourage you to read um, the Catholic Candle, along with the Recusant and the Catacombs. The Catholic Candle, the, the recent one of March 2017, has some very good articles, but it shows how Sadly, sadly, even Society of St. Pius X priests and even Bishop Tissier are now crumbling on questions of basic morality. And I'll just touch briefly on this. There's a document that came out of the of uh, bishops in the East Coast. The document is called Comfort and Consolation by the Bishops of Maryland. And this document, along with the document of the American Association of Catholic Bishops, they're now teaching that if someone is dying, you can refrain from giving them food and water and let them just starve to death. That's the new teaching, and it is condemned by the fifth commandment. Thou shalt not kill. And when someone, if, if, if grandma or grandpa is dying, you are obliged Every nurse, every doctor, every family member, we are obliged that they get water and they get food. And the food can be fed by IVs. That is not extraordinary. And that is obliging by the moral law. And if you or I participate in starving someone, it is murder. And the bishops are saying this is permittable. And of course they bury it in all these fuzzy words. Patience, this is taken from that horrible document, um, from Comfort and Consolation. Patients are those who represent them, their proxies, should choose medically assisted nutrition and hydration, except when the patient can be 
can no longer absorb them, or when, having sought good counsel, the patient or the proxy judges it excessively burdensome to the patient. If it's burdensome to the patient to get a little prick so he can get food IV fed to him, that is not morally justified. So now, Bishop, sad to say, Bishop Tissier and society priests are approving this. And we can't approve this. It is murder. And these are basic moral things, moral truths that were never an argument, even 20 years ago. So my point is, once you compromise on the faith, you compromise on morals. Vatican II compromises on the faith. Now they're justifying suicide and assisted suicide. Society of St. Pius X of old compromised on the Catholic faith. And uh, the consequence is they're going to compromise on morals. And that's what's happening. So, dear faithful, to summarize then, The Catholic Church is the heavenly Jerusalem. The Catholic Church, we belong to that heavenly city when we profess the Catholic faith. And Babylon is always at war with Jerusalem. And Babylon means the city of confusion. Babylonia means confusion, many tongues. Confusion because it's the spirit of the world, the devil in the flesh. Babylon is Vatican II. Vatican to- ba- Babylon is this world the worldly spirit. Babylon is always at war against Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, the Catholic Church of tradition on earth. Vatican II belongs to Babylon. It is of the spirit of the world. It dissolves Jesus Christ. It attacks His divinity. It attacks His kingship. It attacks His priesthood. It attacks His only role as the only Savior. And that's why we have to reject Vatican II categorically, as Archbishop Lefebvre did and said we have to do until Rome comes back to tradition. Now Bishop Fillet is set on this agreement. He says all that's missing is the seal. They've already swallowed it. And that's been going on. And I just beg you to pray for the priests, for the faithful to wake up. Because they will, if Bishop Fillet can, and Bishop Tissier can slide on the matters of faith and morals, so can we. And any of us can slide and fall. So we've got to stay faithful and not compromise on the holy Catholic faith, but stand on the shoulders of our Archbishop Lefebvre and of all the popes of tradition. And with that, we stay Catholic. We belong to the heavenly city, and we have to battle on. Let me just conclude by reading a little bit from some objections. This is from a letter from printed in the Catholic candle as well, of March. It's a, it's a letter to the faithful and friends by Father Raphael. Father Raphael is with us in the resistance. He's a Benedictine priest and monk down in Ecuador. Um, he's, he, his great-granduncle was St. Raphael Guizar, whose body is incorrupt in Veracruz, Mexico. There's many miracles that he performed. And his other great-granduncle was a Cristero general, who fought the Freemasons and defended their homes and their towns and their Catholic Church against the persecution of the Freemasons during the uh, 20th century. So, Father Raphael is from a fighting stock. And his own father, a good good Catholic man, he himself in the 60s fought, physically fought the communists in the streets of Mexico. They prayed the rosary and they were physically, they had to fight physically. So Father Raphael is from a, a fighting stock and pray he preserves strong in the faith. So he wrote this letter. I'm not going to read the first half, but I'm just going to read, jump to the second half. He says, <clears throat> To be with Christ, we must reject Vatican II and its diabolical spirit, from which has arisen another religion with the appearance of being Catholic. We must also fight and condemn that new religion, and we must have no part with it, under penalty of having otherwise joined its betrayal of Christ. Now, since the 1996 creation of Grec and the Society of St. Pius X, 
has been systematically trying to incorporate into this false religion, which cloaks itself with the appearance of being Catholic. Faith is a habit, and Catholics win or lose on the level, level of the faith. To go along with the SSPX's expedient compromise with error is totally reprehensible. By their fruits you will know them. The Society of Bias X, the new one now, systematic, uh, its systematic adultery with, other, any, with another religion forces us into a systematic separation from the new SSPX. So as you know, as Father Pfeiffer and I always say, and the priest of the resistance throughout the world, we just continue the Society of Saint Pius X, that's all. We continue the seminary, the priory life, the statutes, the rule. We don't need to invent anything new. And we hope that many society new priests who are going into the new religion will pull out of that and join with us to just continue the work of rebuilding the Catholic Church and working to the, for the conversion of Rome to come back to tradition. But until then, we can't compromise. And that's what Bishop Filet has done. And he, he really sealed it with 2012's doctrinal declaration, April 15th. I continue now. Now, Father ends his letters with a series of objections. And you have heard this, and maybe some of these are your own objections, but let's cover a few of them here, and they're quite... They're quite thorough and good. First objection. But we want to resist internally without leaving the Society of St. Pius X. And many priests are saying this. I'll resist from within. Answer. The Superior General has changed the course of the Society of St. Pius X's ship. It is only safe to stay in that ship if the ship's captain, the Superior General, Bishop Follet, returns to the original course. His failure to do so is a grave objection, objective sin of omission. All that is needed for the ship's passengers to change direction is for the ship to have changed direction, as it has. You cannot resist the direction of the ship from inside without, without openly fighting with and overcoming the ship's captain. The passengers' failure to openly fight against the ship's captain makes them accomplices, at least by their omission, in the Society of St. Pius X's bad new direction. My dear faithful, with the ship heading progressively towards ever greater ruin, that is, accepting Vatican II, the new Mass, etc., do not stay on board because of your affection for the captain or his crew. Because the captain no longer follows Jesus Christ's principles, we must not follow or help him, although we must still pray for him. Second objection. But we don't see any bad change in practice. And I hear this a lot. I don't see any new Mass, and among the young people especially. I don't see any new Mass. I don't see handshaking and altar girls. I say, not yet. Listen to Father Raphael. The faith is of the things that cannot be seen. The battle is at the level of principles. Waiting to react until you see the consequences of the false principles is like waiting to leave the ship until you see it has arrived at the wrong destination, although you know the ship has already begun the wrong course. It is too late to avoid the wrong destination when you already have arrived there. Leave the ship now because it is so seriously off course and is heading to that wrong destination. Third objection. But the superiors have the grace of state. We should just pray. Answer. Our Lord said, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. He didn't say, pray and trust in the superiors. Rather, he asks us to watch, because there can be wolves among the shepherds and among the sheep. Just because one has the grace of state doesn't mean that he will be faithful to that grace. The present SSPX superiors are not faithful to their grace of state. And I add, what did Archbishop Lefebvre do? We had the Pope himself teaching error. And Archbishop Lefebvre had to say to the Pope, we have to disobey you. You have no right to teach these things and do these things. So if Archbishop Lefebvre had to stand up to the Pope, 
we can certainly stand up to a superior general and tell him, look, you're teaching and doing wrong. Always with charity and respect, obviously. Four. Fourth objection. We have to obey our superiors. <laughs> Answer, Father Raphael. Yes, always, except when they order, they order something against the faith or the commandments. Faith is above obedience. Blind obedience is forbidden and is evil. We must stick with the faith. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The righteous shall live by faith. And I add, this was what Archbishop Lefebvre said too, uh, Satan's masterstroke was to destroy obedience to all of Catholic tradition through obedience. And the Freemasons themselves said this in the 1800s, we're going to destroy the Catholic Church by obedience. And they're doing it, because the superiors go with the new religion, they command it on the, the little, little guys, and the little guys follow along under obedience. While we all know our catechism, and and we have to stand up and say, no, I can't obey an order that goes against the faith or God's commandments. Fifth objection. But we need the sacraments. I'll only go to the SSPX for the sacraments. Answer, Father Raphael. Living the faith is the spirit of the sacraments. One spiritual communion or spiritual mass can be worth more to a person well disposed than the sacraments to a badly disposed person. God is faithful and supplies our necessities with His power, mercy, and goodness. Without the faith, it is impossible to please God. A priest without the true anti-liberal faith or endangering it is not pleasing to God and should not be followed. A liberal priest's compromised faith risks his parishioner's faith. It is a danger against the faith to go to a priest who is putting his own faith in danger. And when the priority of a group, like the new SSPX, is no longer the defense of the anti-liberal faith and the teaching of the truth, that group loses its savor and its reason to exist. Everything either helps bring us to Christ or tends to lead us away from Him. Either a priest leads to Christ or tends to lead us away from Him. He told us, whoever does not gather with me scatters. You might respond, Although the SSPX does scatter, it also gives valid sacraments. Could I then go just to receive the sacraments? Father Raphael's answer, no. Some priests of the Fraternity of St. Peter might give valid sacraments. Yet Archbishop Lefebvre prohibited anyone to go with them. He said, the ones from St. Peter's Fraternity betray us in the fight for the defense of the faith. It is a sin to put the faith in danger. It puts your faith in danger to go to a priest belonging to a group which no longer has Christ, the faith, and the truth as its top priority. Because that priest is not with Christ, but is against him. And you would be an accomplice to his sin, when in such a serious matter you don't resist the liberalism he also should resist. And I might add also, we have the example of many saints ahead of, before us who would not go to the mass of the peace priests in Hungary, the communist compromisers. Priests who signed the, the, the Freemasonic oath of the constitutional oath of the clergy in the French Revolution. The, the Catholic people wouldn't go to the mass. St. John Vianney's parents were one of those people. They preferred going to mass in a barn in the middle of the night than the parish church on the bright Sunday morning with full choir and altar boys in their clean cassocks, but with a priest who compromised on the faith. And remember, those days it was only the Latin Mass. So same now, we cannot compromise with priests who compromise. And I, and I, and I beg you, pray for us priests of the resistance to remain faithful. Because any of us can fall, any of us can trip, any of us can lose it. And we got to humbly beg Our Lady to stay strong in the faith. Last objection. But we must stay together. We don't want division. Answer. Our Lord Jesus Christ promised us only union in the faith, hope, and charity. This is supernatural union with, G with Jesus Christ. Leaving the uncompromising faith and charity 
And the fight for the uncompromising faith and charity is to leave the fight for Jesus Christ and to stop fighting under his banner by no longer making the defense of the true anti-liberal Catholic faith its priority, the new SSPX thereby divided those who keep fighting for, for this faith from those who want to unite by a different bond, conciliar recognition, which conflicts with the co uncompromising faith. The SSPX is the one now causing division, because it no longer resists modernism and so pushes away those who continue this anti-modernist fight. So the ones which divide, Bishop Follet, are the true Catholic resistance. They are not. They want unity in something other than the glorious, uncompromising Catholic faith. May God bless you, dear faithful. You are in my prayers and masses every day. Long live Christ the King. Viva Cristo Rey. My blessing, Father Raphael. So as you know, Father Raphael suffered some persecution because he spoke out against Bishop Williamson's errors on the new Mass. That new Mass gives grace, the new faith, the new church uh, can, gives grace. And you can go to Sede Vecantes Masses, you can go to Novosoto Masses, you can go to the most least con contaminated Latin Masses. And um, these are errors. And Archbishop Lefebvre spoke very clearly. He was very clear. Hold the faith. Don't compromise to the right with Sede Vicantism. Don't compromise to the left with New Mass, Vatican II. Hold the course of tradition. Hold the course of Saint, the Apostles, the Fathers of the Church, the great doctors of the Church, the great encyclicals of the Popes from Pius XII before him, and all the condemnations of the Church. Because these condemnations... That thunder and lightning, the lightning of teaching the truth, the thunder of condemnations, both come from the Holy Ghost. Christ himself condemned sin and error. He thundered the truth, and he taught the light of the Catholic faith. So the church has always done. So we have to hold fast to her bright, glorious teaching, and also her thunderous condemnations of liberalism and all the errors of the modern world, including communism, evolution, modernism, etc. Let's persevere, dear few faithful, holding fast to the daily rosary, the scapular, fighting under the banner of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. May her hour of triumph come, come soon. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.